Hi all, let's take a look at your practice test covering uh, sections from chapter eight and chapter 10 up through 10.6. Um, your first problem is going to be different from problems two through 12. So first problem you'll need to remember is on sequences, not series, they follow different rules. Uh, problems two through 12 will be our chapter 10.2 uh, through 10.6. Uh, sequences problems, and then the last two problems go back to chapter eight, where you're asked a question on arc length and a question on surface area. So first of all, uh, keep in mind that I will allow you to use any one page of notes, uh, and keep in mind that is one-sided page of notes, so you can write down whatever you want on any one standard sheet of paper, so it has to be the same size as a normal uh, piece of paper. So anything like that, that you can fit on one page, whatever you think would best help you on the test, you're welcome to bring. Uh, for this first question that's with our sequences, uh, the way we know a sequence converges is if we can take the limit of the, the, the general term of the sequence, and if that limit goes to any finite value, then the sequence converges. If it doesn't, uh, if it goes to infinity or if it goes to some undefined value where it's not going to any one value, then it diverges. So in the first problem here, I gave you the general term a sub n is equal to n times the group, the square root of n squared plus three minus n. Now, this one's a little tricky when you think about it. If you just say, well, if I allow n to go to infinity, I would have an infinite term times this would be a term approaching zero because you'd have a term approaching infinity minus a term approaching infinity. So I'd say, well, that's indeterminate. So what I did, I first algebraically simplified, which I strongly recommend there, and say, well, please notice if I ask you to factor a uh, factor of n out of this group, the second term has an n, you can factor an n out of the square root by saying a factor of the square root of n squared out. When you factor an n squared out of your square root, your first term becomes one, your second term becomes three over n squared. So I factored that n out of this term, the square root of n squared out of this term, bring that to the outside, and it makes your n on the outside and n squared. Now, this is still indeterminate, because you're going to say, well, this term's going to go to infinity as n goes to infinity. This term as n goes to infinity would become the square root of one minus one, which is also zero. Infinity times zero is one of our indeterminate forms. So here's what I did. I said, well, anytime I have an indeterminate limit, I should be able to use L'Hopital to figure that out. In order to use L'Hopital, I have to get a fraction. So this goes back to section 4.5 in your book, back to the good old Calc 1 skills. So what I did in this case is I said this limit as n approaches infinity of the general term a sub n, that's going to equal the limit as n approaches infinity. And I've left all of this in the numerator. If I need to force that n squared down to the denominator, you need to put it as n to the negative 2 or as I did here, 1 over n squared, same thing as n to the negative 2. Now, L'Hopital tells us to take the derivative of the numerator and the derivative of the denominator and then try to take the limit. Because at this point, this fraction is of indeterminate form. The numerator is going to 0, the denominator is going to 0 as n goes to infinity. 0 over 0 is indeterminate in limit form. So I can say, well, OK. Take the derivative of the numerator. This group is the same thing as the group to the one half power. I bring the one half down in front times the group left alone to the negative one half power times the derivative of the inside. Derivative of the inside is the same thing as the derivative of three n to the negative two with respect to n. So I just said, well, that's going to be negative six n to the negative three. I'm looking at my denominator and I'm thinking of it as just n to the negative two. So its derivative is going to be negative two n to the negative three, which is where I get that. Then a lot of stuff's going to cancel here. Uh, notice 
your factor of n to the negative three in the numerator and denominator cancel. One half times negative six would be negative three, but I see that my denominator is negative two, so I just went ahead and canceled the negative out. That's where the three came from. And then I can say this group uh, really is a one half power in the denominator. And if it goes to the denominator, it becomes positive and I went ahead and put it as the square root. Then I had the factor of two left in the denominator as well. So I ended up with the limit as n approaches infinity of three over two on the square root of one plus three over n squared. Then as n goes to infinity, I know that term goes to zero. That's okay. I still have three over two on the square root of one. And so I can say, if I take my limit as n approaches infinity, my final answer is just three over two. Now, remember what I said earlier, if this were a series, this would be evidence that the series does not converge. Uh, but in a sequence, we say a sequence converges anytime the limiting value goes to any finite number. We can say this, this series, uh, sorry, sequence, sequence, a sub n converges to three over two. Again, if it were a series, it would diverge because the limiting value is not zero. So I can say, all right, this sequence converges to three over two. Uh, now, what about the second part of this question, part B? I give you the sequence b sub n, and I just define it to be the exponential function e to the four minus n squared. So right now, if I'm thinking, all right, if I allow n go to infinity, um, that's going to be e to a negative infinite power, which you might understand is, is zero, and you know it converges from that. Just to make sure I was very clear, I went ahead and rewrote this, and I said, well, the limit as n approaches infinity of this exponential function. I can say I could put that exponential function in the denominator if I change the sign on the exponent. That means e in the denominator would be to the positive n squared minus four power. Now, this makes it a little bit more obvious. When n goes to infinity now, you're going to have e to an infinite power, which definitely is infinity, but your numerator is just a one. One divided by an infinite number, or one or any finite number divided by an infinite numbers has a limiting value of zero. So therefore we can say this sequence b sub n converges to zero. Uh, now, our first of the series questions, number two asks you to find the sum of the series from three to infinity of one over n minus one times n plus one. So I can say, well, okay, that's a telescoping series. Instantly, you should think back to your wonderful method of partial fraction decomposition and say, ah, it's the same idea as far as how I begin the problem. I look at my fraction within and I break it into A over N minus one plus B over N plus one. Uh, when I uh, multiply by the least common denominator of N minus one, N plus one, I'm left with one is equal to A times N plus one plus b times n minus one. Then I'm able to allow n to equal one, that cancels out my b term, and I'm left with the equation one is equal to two a, thus a is equal to one half. If I allow n to equal negative one, that results in the equation negative two b is one, thus b is negative one half. Now, if you put that one half in for A and the negative one half in for B, you see that this is the summation of one half over N minus one, and then it would be plus a negative one half over N plus one. Instead of writing it like that, I thought it would be better to go ahead and factor that one half on the outside of the summation. So you'll say, so, so you'll see, I put our original summation is equal to one half times the sum from three to infinity of one over n minus one minus one over n plus one. Now, uh, once I do that, we know we're trying to find the sum of the series, the sum of any, of, of any infinite series we can call S. So I'm saying S is equal to one half times the limit as n approaches infinity. And then you just need to start thinking about what the terms would be. Your first term is when n is three. So plug a three in, you'd get one over three minus one. That's where the one half came from. Minus one over three plus one. Well, that's 
one over two minus one over four. And at the beginning, I did not have those red slashes that came later. So the first term is one half minus one fourth plus the second term would be when n is four. When you allow n to equal four, you're going to have one over three minus one over five. And then I quickly saw that each successive term thereafter is going to have the terms canceling out. And you think, well, why? Because the third term is going to start with n equals five. When n is five, your first term is a positive one fourth. Your second term is going to be a minus one sixth. That positive one fourth cancels with two terms prior minus one fourth. And then I can see that, oh, okay, then every minus term is going to cancel out with the plus term two terms later on. My next term would start with a plus one fifth. That's going to cancel out this minus one fifth. The next term would start with a plus one sixth. It's going to cancel out this minus one sixth. So I see that every one of these terms are going to cancel with the exception of the first part of the first two terms. There's nothing that's going to cancel out the positive one half or the positive one third. In the same manner, I can see that, well, this item by item cancellation is going to occur, except for the first part of the first two terms. And then logically I can say, well, then the last part of the last two terms is not going to cancel either. So that's why I went ahead and said, this keeps on going all the way to the n minus first term. Uh, n minus first term would be one over n minus two minus one over n. And then your last term, the nth term, which is just your one over n minus one, minus one over n plus one. I know that there's never going to be a positive term that's going to cancel out the minus one over n. Notice the greatest the positive term can get in the denominator is one over n minus one. Can't cancel out that minus one over n. Also, nothing's going to cancel out the minus one over n plus one. So I have four terms that did not cancel, the first part of the first two terms and the last part of the last two terms. The sum of this series is gonna be one half, the limit as n approaches infinity of the four terms that did not cancel out. Now, in all actuality, it's really irrelevant, those last two terms, because keep in mind, we're taking the limit as n approaches infinity. So as n approaches infinity, those last two terms go to zero. So the only thing I had to worry about was one half plus one third. And I said, well, that's going to be three over six plus two over six is five over six. I'm taking the sum of five over six, multiplying it by one half. Please don't forget the one half I had to factor out in the very beginning of the problem. My sum is gonna be one half times five over six for five over 12. Gorgeous problem there. The next two problems are pretty quick. Uh, they're both our geometric series. And we remember the geometric series, the geometric series test says that they converge anytime the common ratio R is a number less than one. Uh, and that needs to make logical sense. You say, well, of course it's gonna converge if R is less than one. That's just guaranteeing that each term of your series is getting smaller in absolute value. And now the value of R, it could be negative. So I should say the absolute value of the common ratio needs to be less than one. So positive or negative values between negative one and one will ensure that each value of your series is getting smaller as you go on to larger values of N. Uh, if it's equal to one or greater than one, your series is gonna diverge because you're adding a summation of, of numbers that never get smaller. Uh, now, if I look at the first one, uh, the mistake that I see students make on a problem like number three is they'll tell me that their common ratio is three fourths. That's terrible. Uh, so the common ratio is whatever value is raised to the n. So in this problem, you see, well, that three is not raised to the n power. So if the, 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 ugh, the, the only term raised to the n power is the four, but be careful, that's a four in the denominator. I need to understand that this could be rewritten as three times the group one fourth to the n. So when I ask you what your first term is, remember C is always your first term. Your first term is just what happens uh, when you plug the first term of your series in. You say, well, if I plug a zero in for n, my first term would be three over four to the zero. That's three over one. C, the first term is three. 
The common ratio here, I need you to understand, is one fourth because this is the same thing as three times one fourth to the n power. Uh, and so my common ratio, each term is going to get smaller by a factor of one fourth as we go. Since that one fourth is less than one, this series is clearly going to converge. And then I said, if it converges, find its convergent uh, sum. The sum of any geometric series that converges should be the first term divided by one minus the common ratio. The first term, plug in zero, you get a three. Uh, so C is equal to three over one minus R becomes one over uh, one minus one fourth. In order to simplify that easily, just multiply by four over four. That will give you 12 over four minus one. That's 12 over three. 12 over three is the final answer of four. So if we add the terms in the series, if you just wanted to list out the first few terms, it'd be uh, three and then three fourths plus three sixteenths plus three over 64. Uh, and it would keep on going like that. The sum of all of those numbers would approach four. That's the limiting value. Uh, now, for number four, similar but more interesting problem, we have the summation from zero to infinity of seven plus six to the n divided by seven to the n. Now, what's important here is that you understand this is not one geometric series because there's uh, two terms in that numerator. So just like we can split up an integral problem and say we can distribute the denominator into each term in the numerator and integrate two separate easier problems. Same thing in this, in a summation problem, I can say it's the summation from zero to infinity of seven over seven to the n, plus the summation from zero to infinity of six to the n over seven to the n. That's what I've done here. And in each of these cases, I've rewritten it to make it a little easier to understand. So this first part, if I had seven over seven to the n, I can think of that as seven times the common ratio one seventh to the n power. This makes it very clear what my common ratio r is in this problem. r is going to be one seventh. Your first term is going to be seven. When you let n equal zero, you're going to have seven times one seventh to the zero. So you say, okay, uh, the first term C is seven, your common ratio is one seventh. I can find the sum of this series. Now the sum of the other series, you'd say it's plus the summation of six to the n over seven to the n. Well, that's the same thing as six sevenths to the n. Here I can see my first term, uh, C is going to be one. If I let n equal zero, I would get a one. And my, clearly my common ratio, each successive term after that is gonna be multiplied by an increasing power of six sevenths thus getting smaller and thus converging. That's what I said here in your geometric series test, you need to make sure that both of these series converge and clearly they do. Both of the R values have an absolute value less than one. So the sum of this series is the sum of these two individual series. The first one is going to have the sum of the first term C, which is seven divided by one minus the common ratio, one minus one seventh. Your second one, your first term would be one, Divide that by one minus R, where R is six sevenths here. In both of these, I just multiplied by seven over seven. Uh, when you do that in your first one, you get 49 over seven minus one. In your second one, you'll get seven over seven minus six. So clearly that gives me 49 over six plus seven. Uh, it's the same thing as 49 over six plus 42 over six for a total nice answer of 91 over six. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking that's a pretty cool problem. It is pretty cool. Uh, let me go on to number five. Number five says, use the test for divergence. So let me make sure I talk about this uh, because I don't want the problem on the test to be slightly different. And then you're like, oh, I don't know what to do with that. The test for divergence, I need you to remember, it can only tell you if a series diverges. What does the test for divergence say? Say It says, well, if the limit of the term, of the general term, uh, in this case, the general term as the variable k, I can say, well, the, the limit of a sub k as k goes to infinity, uh, if that has a limiting value of zero, then the test for divergence tells us nothing. The series could converge, could diverge. Well, what if the limit as k approaches infinity of the general term in there gives us some value other than zero? 
you, the test for divergence says if it's anything other than zero, then that series diverges because you're adding an infinite number of non-zero terms. So you say, okay, if it's not zero, it diverges. If it is zero, we don't know. Test for divergence is inconclusive. Now, please keep that in mind. Now on this test, I gave you a problem and I asked you to use the test for divergence. And so you say, all right, can I take the limiting value of the index value K in this case, let that general term go to infinity, is that going to equal zero? And if it is, then it's inconclusive. Uh, if it's not zero, then we say the divergence test tells us this series diverges. So I took the limiting value of, of a sub k in this case. So when I did that, uh, I just went ahead and looked at, well, my, my value of uh, my, my variable k in the numerator would be a k squared. In the denominator, I'm going to have a k to the third. Yes, I would have other terms of the polynomial in the numerator and denominator. Those terms are irrelevant. Please remember, in an infinite limit of a rational function, uh, all you have to do is say, well, you only care about the largest powers in the numerator and denominator. And in this case, since the denominator is of greater power, this fraction is going to zero. So you say, okay, the limit as k approaches infinity of k squared over k cubed, it would reduce down to one over k. And then as k goes to infinity, that goes to zero. So we say, well, what does this tell us? It doesn't tell us anything. The test for divergence is inconclusive, but I want you to say something. So you say, well, all right, since the limiting value is zero, therefore this series could converge or diverge. I don't want you going in and using any other test to tell me if it converges or diverges. We're just supposed to use the test for divergence. So use the test for divergence to determine if this series diverges? Well, the test for divergence doesn't tell us in this case. So the only time it tells us something is if this is some finite value other than zero. And in that case, it would tell us it diverges. In this case, it's saying, well, it could diverge, but it could also converge. So divergence test doesn't help a lot in this problem, but that's okay. We still use the test for divergence. Uh, number six, we're supposed to use the comparison and P series uh, to determine the convergence of one over the cube root of N squared minus five. So I'm thinking, okay, comparison and P series. P series is just one over N to a power where the P series power is always the degree difference between the numerator and denominator. So before I even do this problem, I'm thinking, well, the power on n in that denominator, that, that's, that's essentially n to the two over three power. So I'm thinking, okay, I'm gonna compare this with a P series of one over n to the two thirds. That's a P series of two thirds. What do I know about that? I know that it diverges all P series uh, where P is less than or equal to one diverge. So that's how I need to show that this series diverges with the comparison test. That's how I did it. So I said, all right, here's my series. I'm going to compare it with a divergent P series of one over n to the two thirds power. And again, I know that that diverges because the P series test is anytime P is less than or equal to one, uh, it is a divergent series because the fractions are not getting small enough, quickly enough to converge. Uh, if that were any number greater than one, like if that was one over n squared, converges. Uh, now, the way I show that, it's, that our series is divergent is I have to show that the general term of our series is greater than the general term of the corresponding P series. And just to make sure I was very clear here, I went ahead and put the fractional exponent back in terms of radical form. I said, well, n to the two thirds power, that's the same thing as the cube root of n squared. Now, clearly this fraction is larger than this fraction. You think, why is it clear? Well, think about it. You're subtracting something from that denominator. So I know that this denominator is always going to be smaller than this denominator. The same numerator divided by a smaller denominator makes this fraction larger than this fraction. So I say, okay, this is always going to be larger than this as n goes to infinity. So then that's showing that the general term of our series is larger than the general term of a series that diverges, which is conclusive evidence to say that our series in question also diverges. That is the 
uh, the comparison and P-series test. Now, for number seven, I ask you to use the Leibniz test, also known as the alternating series test, to determine the convergence of the sum from one to infinity of negative one to the n over the square root of n. So whether you call it the Leibniz test uh, or the alternating series test, you just say, all I have to do is take the limit of the non-alternating part. And if I can show that that limit goes to zero, boom, by the Leibniz alternating series test, this series converges. So here's my series. And I just said, well, the limit as n approaches infinity of the non-alternating part. So you just ignore that negative one to the n. The numerator is just going to be one over the square root of n. So if this did not alternating sign, this would be my general term. So does the limit as n approaches infinity of that term go to zero? Sure it does, because it'd be one over the square root of infinity. One divided by any form of infinity goes off to zero. Since that goes off to zero by the alternating series test, again, or the Leibniz test, whatever you wanted to call it, we would say this is conclusive evidence that this series converges. What if that had been anything other than zero? Then you wouldn't be able to say it converges. Uh, but as long as you can show that's convergent, or sorry, <laughs> as long as you can show that that is zero, you've shown that the series converges. Uh, now, for number eight, I'm asking you to use the limit comparison test to determine the convergence of this series. Now, as soon as you see this series, uh, uh, anytime what's inside would be a rational function, you should be thinking, well, okay, I'm gonna compare it with a P-series. P-series should always be the degree differential between the numerator and denominator. There's a degree difference of two. I'm automatically, I'm gonna compare this with one over N squared. What do I know about one over N squared? Is a convergent P-series with P equals two. Convergent P-series are always values of P where it's greater than one. So you'll see as I work to my problem, here's the problem I'm trying to work with. I'm going to compare this with a convergent P-series, one over N squared, converges because that degree on the N is two, and anytime it's greater than one, it converges. Now, what does the limit comparison test tell us? It tells us that we need to find the limit as N approaches infinity, of the general term of the series we're trying to find something about, divided by the general term of the series we know the convergence of. And if this fraction is just some finite number, we can say, oh, then our, our series is just a constant multiple of the other series. So whatever the convergence divergence of the other series is, is the same as our series. So in this case, I was able to take this limiting value and uh, if I divide by one over n squared, it's the same thing as multiplying by n squared over one. So you'll see that's why my numerator just became three n cubed plus seven n squared. When I take the limit as n approaches infinity of that fraction, I get a three. So I'm saying, okay, our, our series is essentially a common multiple of, or a constant multiple of three times a series that I know converges. So if you're a constant multiple of three times a series that converges, then you're also a series that converges. That is the logic of the limit comparison test. So you'd say, since the limiting value is three, our series also converges. So I want to see some uh, uh, final statement here. So this series converges and need to show, show the logic why the limiting value three in this case. Uh, for number nine, I gave you a, a, a general term in there that had an exponential in it. So it has a geometric within it. Uh, I'm asking you to use the limit comparison test to determine the convergence of the summation from four to infinity of 15 over two to the n minus nine. So when I'm thinking of that, I'm thinking, well, I'm gonna to have to use a geometric series at some point because that two to the n power, uh, that exponential function in there is gonna generate a geometric series. So here's what I'm thinking. I know that the 15 part, well, I could, I could always just multiply that to the outside. So the inside is essentially the same thing as one over two to the n minus nine, which is sort of the same thing as just one over two to the n. As n goes to infinity, nine becomes inconsequentially small compared to the exponential function two to the n. So I'm thinking, okay, 
I'm going to compare this with the geometric series one half to the n. And the reason I wrote it as one half to the n instead of one over two to the n is it makes it more obvious that your common ratio is one half. And you say, well, why did you need to make that more obvious? Because we know geometric series always converge if that absolute value of your common ratio is less than one. Well, one half is less than one. So this would be a convergent geometric series. Now, if I can show that the limit of the general term of the series that I'm trying to find out the convergence of divided by the general term of the series that I do know the convergence of, if I can show that's just some constant multiple, then it's the same answer. That's what I do here. So I take the limit as n approaches infinity of 15 over two to the n minus nine, and I divide that, please notice, instead of writing it as one half to the n, I said, well, that's the same thing as one over two to the n. In this format, it's better to write it like this, it means the same thing. But the reason that this is easier is now I can say, well, that 15, I can just factor out in front. And then I can say, this is the same thing as multiplying by two to the n over one, which means the two to the n goes in the numerator. This makes it easy to evaluate now because you say, well, as n goes to infinity, I'm going to have 15 times a fraction that goes to one because these two terms have the exact same value and that minus nine becomes inconsequential. Infinity minus nine is still infinity. So I can say this fraction goes to one. We're gonna have 15 times a number approaching one. The limiting value is going to be 15. Now, again, what that tells us is that since the limiting value is just a constant multiple, the convergence or divergence of our series is the same thing as the series we're comparing it to. I compared it with a convergent series. That means our series also converges. Pretty cool question there. Uh, all right, let's see. Uh, for our next one here. Ooh, beautiful. We're using the ratio test to determine the convergence of the sum from one to infinity of n to the 400th power divided by n factorial. All right. So now, if I think about this problem, I can say anytime I'm doing the ratio test, I'm going to go ahead and not even worry about the limit. I'm just going to uh, think about what is the absolute value of that ratio of the a sub n plus first term divided by the a sub nth term. So in this case, uh, what I do, uh, and, in, and in this problem, uh, there's no way that anything can be negative. So you'll see, I just ignored the absolute value since nothing could be negative. And I said a sub n plus one, that's gonna be n plus one to the 400th power divided by n plus one factorial divided by a sub n, I just said, well, let's multiply by the reciprocal of a sub n that puts an n factorial in the numerator and an n to the 400 in the denominator. Now, in simplifying these terms, I'll say, okay, let's put my two factorial terms in the first fraction. I have an n factorial and my denominator n plus one factorial means n plus one times n factorial. That's going to allow me to cancel the n factorials in the next step. Uh, the other ones I just went ahead and put over here, the n plus one to the 400 over n to the 400. So now let's think about the limit as n approaches infinity of this ratio of a sub n plus one over a sub n. I can say, okay, uh, the limit as n approaches infinity. My first term, where did this come from? I just said, well, n factorial and, and n factorial cancels. So I'll have one over n plus one here times now, I know that this is a limit as n is approaching infinity. So anytime I have a polynomial function, which both of these would be, I only care about the largest term. So I went ahead and said, well, yeah, this is going to be an n to the 400th plus 400 other terms. You'll have an n to the uh, 399th power and n to the 398th power. I don't care about all of those because all of those are infinitely times smaller than that largest power. So I'll just say, I know that this is an n to the 400th plus dot, 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 doesn't matter. My denominator has an n to the 400th. 
Now, I didn't want to cancel those out just yet because I wanted to think about how do they interact with the other fraction. That other fraction is going to come over and multiply these, and the numerator one times that just gives me the n to the 400. But in the denominator, I'm going to have an n times an n to the 400. It means my denominator is one power greater than my numerator. I'll have an n to the 400 divided by n to the 401. And any time the degree of the denominator exceeds the degree of the numerator in a limit where the variable is going to infinity, that fraction goes to zero. So we say, okay, our limiting value is zero. What does that tell us? Well, the ratio test tells you that any time the value of your common ratio limit as n approaches infinity of a sub n plus one over a sub n, any time the value of that ratio is less than one, then your series converges. Well, zero is clearly less than one. So I can say my limiting value is less than one. Zero is less than one. Therefore, this series converges. Done. Nice final answer. Uh, now, the next two problems bring in power series. And they also are applications of the ratio test because in order to work a power series problem, you need to do the ratio test first step. So in a power series, you're gonna have the variable X uh, in with your uh, series and you need to find the values of X that cause the series to converge. So in this first one, for, well, in, in, in number 11, the first of the power series problems, I have the summation negative one to the n times x minus five to the n divided by four to the n times n. Okay, so I said, well, let's use the ratio test again. Just like I did in the last problem, I broke it down. And I said the absolute value of a sub n plus one divided by a sub n. And in this problem, a sub n plus one, you're going to have, uh, oh, actually, uh, since it's absolute value, I, I, started say, I started to say you're going to have negative one to the n plus one. That's completely irrelevant. And you think, why? Because it's an absolute value. So that just means you can completely ignore that. That's irrelevant. So I skipped over that term and I said, okay, first term is going to be x minus five to the n plus one divided by four to the n plus one times n plus one. Now you take that a sub n plus one, divide it by a sub n. I choose to multiply it by the reciprocal of a sub n. So I get four to the n times n in the numerator and an x minus five to the n in the denominator. Now I need to simplify out, out what's inside this absolute value. So I just say, well, what's the absolute value? I'm going to have one power greater of x minus five in the numerator. So I'll have an Factor of x minus five in the numerator, x minus five cancels out of the denominator. I move on to the next term. I have one power greater of four in the denominator. So four to the n cancels out of the numerator and I'll have a four to the first in the denominator. And then the n and the n plus one do not cancel at this point. So I have a factor of n in the numerator. I have a factor of n plus one in the denominator and it does need a parenthesis around it. So I can say, okay, now I need to find out uh, when this series converges. Well, I know it converges when the limit as n approaches infinity of the a sub n plus first over the a sub nth term is less than one. I know it converges for those. So I already have what this a sub n plus one over a sub n simplifies to. Now I need to take the limit as n approaches infinity of that ratio. And I can say, well, as n approaches infinity, I know that this portion of it, n over n uh, plus one, remember what we were saying earlier, uh, anytime the degree of the numerator and denominator is the same, you just take the fraction of the leading coefficients, so you say, well, it's one over one. So I would think of this as the fraction x minus five over four times the limiting value of this is going to one. So you say, well, that's x minus uh, five over four times one which gives me just the x minus five over four inside of your absolute value. Now, again, the ratio test tells us that this would converge if what's inside of this is less than one. That's what I put right here. Series converges when this absolute value of x minus five over four is less than one. That means x minus five over four could be less than one or greater than a negative one. So I have a three-part inequality now. I multiply by four everywhere there. 
And I can say four, negative four needs to be less than X minus five, which needs to be less than positive four. We add a five everywhere and you'll get one is less than X, which is less than nine. Now we are guaranteed that the solution is at least between one and nine. That's what the ratio test tells us. But now the ratio test is inconclusive whenever the value L is equal to one. So you say, well, uh, at when X is one and when X is nine, my limiting value would be one. So I need to test each of those endpoints. So I, uh, and that's what I put right here. You will always, always have in the power series, you'll end up with an interval answer, then need to check your endpoints. So you'd say, okay, when X is one, what happens? Literally plug a one in for X in your problem. You'll have negative one to the N times one minus five to the N divided by four to the N times N. So please notice in the place of X, all I've done is I plugged a one in its place. Now, if I simplify the group one minus five, obviously is a negative four. So I get negative four to the N for that second term in the numerator. Now, what I would do is I'd go ahead and just multiply my numerator bases together. Negative one to the N times negative four to the N, that's going to be four to the N. But then I notice, well, I've got a four to the N in the denominator as well. That cancels out and I'm left with a summation of one over N. What do I know about the summation of one over N? You don't have to do any test. This is a divergent P series in and of itself. This is the series called the harmonic series. Whenever P is one, it's the divergent P series P equals one harmonic series. So I can say, well, what does that tell us? It diverges there. Then we're trying to look for the interval of convergence at one, uh, it diverged, so one X cannot equal one. That's not going to be part of my solution set. So I'm going to say, all right, I know I, I had the right sign here. X must strictly be greater than one. But does it have to be less than nine? Maybe not. I need to test. So if I let X equal nine, again, all I do is I plug a nine in the place of X. And you can say, well, when I do that, that's going to make that second term positive four to the N. I'll have a negative one to the N times four to the N. This four to the N and the four to the N and the denominator cancel, and I would have negative one to the N over N. What do I know about this series? I know that this series, you could either use the alternating series test, also called the Leibniz test. That's what I called it here. And what does the Leibniz test tell us? It tells us if you can take the limit as N approaches infinity of the non-alternating part of this series, which is just one over N, is that limiting value zero? Sure it is. One over infinity would go to zero. Anytime that happens, this is conclusive evidence that this series converges. So you'd say, all right, if that series converges, that means that X equals nine must be included in my convergence interval. The final answer for every power series is has to be look like this. You'll say the interval of convergence is, and it's always in terms of X. What's the lowest value of X? One and it cannot include one because we showed that it diverged at when X was one, but it can include nine because the series converged at nine. So we say interval of convergence is the X values from one to nine, inclusive of nine, exclusive of one. So parentheses around one, bracket around nine. Uh, for the next of the interval of convergence problems, uh, we're supposed to find the, uh, when, when the power series uh, five to the N times X minus, sorry, X plus four to the N over four N, what, what values of X is gonna make this series converge? And so you'd say, well, in order to determine that, again, ratio test is gonna be your, your best first bet. So I need to find the ratio of the A sub N plus first term over the A sub Nth term. When I try to plug in A sub N plus one, I would get, five to the N plus one times X plus four to the N plus one divided by four times the group N plus one. I multiply that by the reciprocal of A sub N, four N in the numerator, five raised to the N power in the denominator times X plus four raised to the N power. So then I can say, well, there's a lot of cancellations that's going to occur here. Uh, if I look at the five to the N plus one, I can say, 
Well, that can be written as five times five to the n. The five to the n will cancel with the five to the n in the denominator. The polynomial terms, I'll put in the next fraction, I have a four n over four times the group n plus one. Nothing simplifies there yet in this step. And then what about the binomial to a power? Well, the x plus four to the n plus one power means x plus four times x plus four to the n. The reason I write it like that is now I can cancel out the factor of x plus four to the n in the denominator. So when I take the limit as n approaches infinity of this a sub n plus one over a sub n, I'm taking the limit as, as n approaches infinity of, the first term here would just be a factor of five. I'll leave the second term alone, the rational function, where you have the polynomial divided by the polynomial, 4n over the group 4 times the group n plus 1. And then my last term is just going to be x plus 4. Well, remember here, the only thing going to infinity is the n. So the only thing impacted by the limit is my second fraction here of 4n divided by 4 times the group n plus 1. So you say, well, your rule there is anytime the degree of the numerator denominator is the same, the limit as n approaches infinity is the same as the fraction of the leading coefficients. That's just four over four, which is a factor of one. So as I take the limit as n approaches infinity, this whole second term just becomes one. So I have the absolute value of five times x plus four left after I take the limit as n approaches infinity. Now, once I do that, I need to go in and say, well, all right, uh, the series is going to converge if this value of L is strictly less than one. So I say, all right, the absolute value of five times X plus four has to be less than one, which means negative one has to be less than five times X plus four, which has to be less than one. We divide by five everywhere, negative one fifth, has to be less than x plus four, which has to be less than one fifth. Now we subtract four everywhere. When I subtract four, that's the same thing as subtracting 20 over five. Negative one over five minus 20 over five gives me negative 21 over five. One fifth minus 20 over five gives me negative 19 over five. So right now I know this series converges if x is a value between negative 21 over five and negative 19 over five. But what I don't know is, well, does it, does it, I, I think I might've said diverge, converges if it's between there. But what I don't know is, well, does it converge at these endpoints? Don't know, have to test them. So the ratio test is inconclusive at the endpoints. So I'll have to test those endpoints. When I plug in negative 21 over five, it gives me this in the original series. And I can see, okay, that's negative 21 over five plus 20 over five inside, inside of this group. That's gonna give me negative one fifth to the N times the five to the N that I already had there. Well, anytime you have the same exponent, you can multiply those bases. So I can say five to the N times negative one fifth to the N. That's the same thing as negative one to the N up there. And I can say, well, all right, uh, that, it's going to generate an alternating series that I can use the alternating series test, otherwise called the Leibniz test on. And I can say, since the limit as n approaches infinity of the non-alternating part, the one over four n, since that part goes to zero, this series converges by the Leibniz test. So that means that X can equal that endpoint of negative 21 over five. I test the other endpoint, negative 19 over five. When I plug that in for the X value, my group becomes negative 19 over five plus 20 over five. I'm going to have a positive one fifth to the N power there. That positive one fifth to the N gets multiplied by the five to the N. I said, well, when I multiply those bases, that's gonna give me just a base of one to the N. It doesn't matter what power one is raised to, one is always one. So my summation just becomes one over four in. And at that point, I just factored the one fourth out so you could easily see, oh, that's just one fourth times the divergent harmonic series where P is one. Uh, if you have one fourth times a series that diverges, your series still diverges. So we just say, 
This is a divergent harmonic series or P series with P equals one. What does that mean? It means that X cannot equal the endpoint of negative 19 over five. Thus, my interval of convergence is the group beginning at negative 21 over five and including that with a bracket up to 19, negative 19 over five, and you have to exclude that with a parenthesis. Uh, and again, I'll always want to see interval of convergence is X equals low value to high value. And remember the brackets are parentheses around the endpoints. Uh, the last two problems, pretty quick and easy problems. Uh, number 13 asks you for the arc length. And you say, okay, uh, arc length of this function on the interval, I have to give you where I want the arc length to start and end at. So I want the arc length on the curve X to the three over two power from x equals one to three. The arc length formula just says, well, the arc length is the integral from where the region begins to where the region ends, the integral from a to b, of the square root of one plus the first derivative squared integrated with respect to x. So as preliminary work, I go ahead and I take the derivative of my function, uh, three over two x to the one half, then I square that derivative, and I would get nine over four X to the first power. So I can say, okay, I've squared my derivative. I got that in there. Now it's just plug it into your formula and you have to know the arc length formula. So the arc length is gonna be the integral from one to three. And instead of square root, I put group to the one half power. I have one plus nine fourths X to the one half power integrated with respect to X. Now. Please remember, anytime you have a linear function raised to a power in something like this, the reverse chain rule works very easily. There's no need to use substitution or anything on this one. It's, it's too easy for that. So you just say, okay, the integral of this is you're going to raise the power on this group by one. So the group one plus nine fourths X gets raised to the three over two power. We divide by that three over two power and you divide by the derivative of what was inside of that group, divide by nine fourths. So when I was thinking of this, I could say, okay, that means my denominator, I'm dividing by 27 over eight. If you're dividing by 27 over eight, that's the same thing as multiplying by eight 27 So I just said, this is gonna be eight 27 uh, on the square root of one plus nine fourths quantity cubed integrated, sorry, not integrated, but evaluated from one to three. Uh, and I was thinking that this would make nice numbers in there, but it doesn't. Uh, so I just went ahead and I plugged the, the, the three in and this first one, it would give me 27 over four plus four over four. So it was uh, 31 over four raised to the three over two power. So I just said, okay, that's not going to be a nice square root cube. So I'll just say it's 31 over four to the three over two. The lower limit is gonna be uh, inside the root, you'll have one plus nine fourths. That's gonna be 13 over four. And I can say for that part, wow, that figure seems to be messing up. I'll keep going since I'm about done. Uh, but on, on my screen, it looks like my video camera is struggling. Hopefully it's okay on your end. We have 31 over four to the three over two power minus 13 over four to the three over two power. I just took that, multiplied it by eight over 27 and I got to my 4.657 answer. I would always want any rounded answer correct to three decimal places and that one is. For our last problem here, I was asking you to find the surface area uh, of the revolution of y equals 2x cubed about the x-axis from x equals 0 to x equals 2. Similar to uh, the arc length, as long as you know the surface area formula, you should be fine. Surface area formula is going to be 2 pi on the integral from where you want the surface area to begin to where you want the surface area to, to end, to begin to end, so a to b, of your function y on the square root of 1 plus the first derivative squared integrated with respect to x. Now, of course, you can't plug the y in there and integrate it with respect to x. We have to put what y is equal to. Before I work this problem, I go ahead and I take the derivative easily to get 6x squared. We square that derivative to get 36x to the fourth. 
So then the surface area in this problem becomes two pi on the integral from zero to two of y, that's your two x cubed, on the square root of one plus, that's where your 36 x to the fourth came from here. Integrate this with respect to x. So then we can say, all right, uh, this should be relatively easy to integrate, and it was. Uh, I just said substitution will help here because I see that the inside has a power of four, the outside has a power of three. That's ideal case for substitution. I let u equal what's inside, the one plus 36 x to the fourth. Then du became four times 36, which is 144 x cubed with respect to x. So then I said, well, I needed a 144 x cubed dx. I had a two x cubed. So clearly I can say, well, I could multiply by 72 on the inside, divide by 72 on the outside. When I divided by 72 on the outside, that's where I got the pi over 36 on the outside. Two over 72 reduces down to one over 36. And so then I said, okay, the substitution will work. All of this is gonna become du along with the 72 that I'm multiplying in there. So I'd be left with the square root of u, which I called u to the one half du. But then I needed to change my limits of integration. So then I said, since I know the substitution is possible, let's change the limits of integration. When I plug in a zero, that's one plus 36 times zero, you get the one. u of two, that would be one plus 36 times two to the fourth. That's 36 times 16, which is 576 plus one for 577. So the upper limit, 577. Uh, then whenever you're integrating here, we know this is just going to become u to the three over two times two thirds. Uh, and I still have my pi over 36 out in front. At this point, what I did is I said, well, that two thirds multiplies the pi over 36. 2 over 3 times 1 over 36, uh, that's going to reduce down to, uh, I know 2 over 36 reduced down to 1 over 18. 18 times 3 is going to be 54. So I got pi over 54 from multiplying these two. Pi over 54 is going to multiply u to the 3 over 2 evaluated from 1 to 577. I knew those would not make nice numbers. So I just said that's pi over 54 times 577 to the three over two power minus obviously one to the three over two power, same thing as one. This would be your exact answer. And the decimal approximation to that gave us 806.285. So this should be a very good preparation for your practice, uh, for, for your test four. Uh, let me know if you have any questions. I'll be glad to help out.